Welcome into the PFF NFL Podcast. Steve Palazzola here with Sam Monson back in our midweek spot here. Sam, we're in Chris's office again. <laughs> he knows, by the way. Oh, he does? He, he let us live the other day. Did you talk to him? I had him downstairs recording something for our YouTube things. And uh, I'm, I, there was one where he had a couple of takes. I was saying, oh, this is, this is more familiar now because he nailed the first few, right? One take, Chris. Yeah, right. Guy's got a bit of experience in front of the camera. He is good. So he rattled off the first few, and then the last one, there was a couple of stumbles. I was like, oh, this is more like what I'm familiar with, you know, me and you. We, we, this this looks like what we do. And he goes, yeah, from my office. <laughs> oh, so he does know. He has yeah, been yeah. listening. Yeah. He's one of the millions. He sounded a little upset by it as well. But I, I liked it not to push it. Oh, see, I needed you to find out if it was good, if it was okay. Well, I couldn't tell, and I didn't want to push it in case it wasn't. So, so we're just going to keep going until we hear otherwise. Really? Yeah. So if you don't hear from us again, it's because it wasn't okay, and we've been fired. Now I'm nervous. Yeah, that's all right. We're huge, Steve. We'll we'll land on our feet somewhere. Probably. Uh, anyway, we've been we've been debating doing our own little separate non-football podcast yeah will you own you know would anybody listen together? to us would anybody listen well, you to you need us? to tell them what the premise is first tell them the premise it's see if, it's we'll ruining see if your childhood listens. with sam and steve right and the idea is we either watch and or play revisit old things from your childhood right so what were we what was the thing we were like old out? arnold movies right like Rocky. watching commando right yeah. we watch commando we come in we give you a little 20 minutes about how ridiculous commando talking is talking about how corny what it was is the thing i it? sent you the other day hulk and hulk hogan's rock and wrestling oh, or something man, the cartoon amazing we anything could, 80s wrestling right. related i could crush we could that. play like old 8-bit video games like fire up you know mutant league football on the genesis yes we uh, these are these are amazing podcasts and you're like yeah. G.I. Joe, right? that type of stuff. I think people would love it. Thundercats. Yes. And that was epic back in 85. So ruining your childhood with Sam and Steve, endless list of things we could talk about. I just, I just want to know, my, I'm, a, I'm lacking a little bit of confidence that people tune in to listen to us uh-huh. versus just the football facts. Well, look, Obviously, think... most people want the football facts. That's yeah. what they're listening to. But I want to know how many of these... You know, our millions would actually tune in and listen to us talk about other stuff. Everybody loves PFF, but I think there's enough people out there that like a bit of Sam and Steve as well. That's all I'm saying. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if we end up doing that. Okay. This is your AFC South podcast. Yeah. Okay. Is this right? We've done the AFC and NFC East. We've done the NFC South. Yeah. So now it's the AFC South. We're working our way division by division. We'll do one more later this week. We're actually going to go. Uh, as of recording time here, we're going to take a little trip to Indianapolis to watch the Colts in a joint practice with the Cleveland Browns. Yep. No we'll Andrew Luck because he well. doesn't have a leg anymore. Um, we'll talk but, about that in a minute. But Baker will be there. He will be. So let's go alphabetically by city. Houston Texans, first team in the AFC South. Last year, when we were talking about the Texans who had a, a pretty good season, we kept thinking that they were overachieving our... Um, you know, our initial assessment of where they were, because especially offensively, Deshaun Watson, DeAndre Hopkins, the only guys who graded reasonably well last year, the O-line graded poorly. And we'll talk about the O-line and some of the sacks and some of the stuff that was posted on PFF.com today. But the defense played pretty well last year. I think that's been the big key for the Texans. Their defense has kind of fluctuated over the last couple of years, and their success has really um, depended on, on what they end up doing. Yeah, and there's the big question mark about will Jadevian Clowney be there right. or will he get traded, which right. obviously is going to happen four seconds after we finish recording this podcast, right. which will make for great listening. Always happens. But as of now, he's going to be on the roster and playing. Oh, wait, should we, should we do a bit in case he's traded? Just cover ourselves? Go yeah. both? Yeah. What a shocking turn of events that Jadevian Clowney has been traded by the Houston Texans. To... Leave the silence and we can put it in later. Insert every team here. Right. Yeah. But now that Clowney's gone, I don't think it's that big of a loss other than maybe their run defense. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. We're now, covered. if Clowney is there, it is nice with Clowney and Whitney Merciless and J.J. Watt having all of them in there. Yeah, I, uh, I was on Will Brinson's podcast, which I don't even remember the name of right now, but I hmm. was talking about... Um, pick, they're not pick six. Are they pick six? Yes. There you go. Well done. Talking about Jadavian like Clowney and this idea of what separates him from, you know, great players at his position. And it's if you created a highlight reel, Jadavian Clowney's would he would look like the best defensive player in the game. He would look like Aaron Donald, he would look like Khalil Mack, Von Miller. The problem is 
I mean, obviously, so do those other guys, right? Everybody's the top f- few players. Their highlight reel is all spectacular. Right. What separates the Khalil Max and the Von Millers from a clowny is like the other 600 plays. And it's what they do between those highlights. And those guys are just a little bit more consistent than Clowney, who has the talent to blow up any play and to be an absolute, a legitimate game changer, a guy that can wreck both run plays and wreck passing plays, rush the passer, just destroy plays. He just doesn't do it as often as those other guys. And it leaves you with this sort of nagging sense that you're not quite getting the player you should be because he has the ability to do it. So he's this incredibly strong run defender, flashes the ability to take over games as a pass rusher, just doesn't do it as consistently as, as those other guys. But I think when you combine him with a J.J. Watt and even with Whitney, Whitney Merciless there as well, like as a combination, they're devastating. Yeah, especially the way they've been used. And you know the, the comparison I always use that, that fits your description pretty well is Jason Pierre-Paul in his prime. JPP had a point where he was a top two or three run defender on the edge, and that was more his game. He would get 10 sacks or 11 sacks or whatever it was, but snap or snap it, he wasn't as dominant as some of his peers. So he certainly put up pass rushing production and was more, you know, run defender than pass rusher. So I think that is what Jadavian Clowney is at this point. And that might not be worth the big long-term contract right. is, the, you know, is the issue. Now, if he's back, like you said, now you've got pieces to work with. You know, especially when Whitney, Whitney Merciless is is healthy. Uh, what else on the defensive side stands out? I think we just had we had some surprises last year. Like Kareem Jackson played yeah. extremely well on the back end until the end of the year. I thought that the secondary and the O line were going to be the two things that held them back last year. The O line wasn't good, but you know you kind of get mitigated at times with Watson. It goes both ways there. But the secondary played a little bit above their skin last year. I think. Yeah, and I think you have to be a little bit concerned about what it looks like on paper heading into the year because they're still relying on Jonathan Joseph, who, let's face it, is getting pretty old at this point and has a fairly extensive injury history behind him. So relying on him to be one of your two starting corners is already a concern. The other one they're relying on is Bradley Roby, who you know was part of that famed no-fly zone in Denver when they had the best, arguably the best secondary, the best defense in the NFL. He was part of that trio with Nakeeb Tlaib and with uh, Chris Harris. And um, he's definitely played at that level before. But again, you wouldn't rely on it at this point, right? He's shown the right. ability to play at that level. He's also shown the ability to play an awful lot worse than that. So where in that spectrum of grading is Bradley Roby going to be? Because they kind of need both those guys to play at a decent level. Um, otherwise, the secondary will be a weakness, I think. Jonathan Joseph, according to PFF Elite Premium Stats 2.0, is 35.3 years old. 35.3. That's okay. how we do his age. So he is ancient. He, younger than us, but still ancient. Damn it. That's another one that's younger than us. But he's a corner. I mean, 35, that's like 45. It's true. You know, Terrence we Newman need, played until he was 70. to come back out of retirement so right? that somebody can be older than us. Jonathan Joseph ran a 4-3-1 Back like in, 1978. Yeah. In 2006. Yeah. Same thing. But his 80.8 grade last year, that was the best he'd ever he posted since 2009. Yeah. I mean, he's still playing at a really high level. It's just at some point, it's kind of like the Tom Brady thing, right? Like at some stage that has to fall off when you get to this age. And, the, you know, the longer it goes, the less you can rely on it heading into a season. Well, the difference, the difference though with Joseph is the 80.8 has, that's, the anomaly yes. over the last yeah, 10 yeah. years because he'd been in the high 70s or in the 60s. He was in the 60s the two previous seasons. So if he regresses a little bit, not necessarily because of age, just because that's who he is as a player, you know, that's a little concerning. He's also one of those players that, that you know, certain players are able to play through niggling injuries or knocks or whatever, and you don't see a giant tail, uh, you know, nosedive in their performance. Joseph, not only is he relatively injury prone, but he's one of those players that immediately falls off a cliff the second he's banged up in any way, shape, or form. Like yeah. 100% healthy Jonathan Joseph is a really good cornerback, a great cover guy. Jonathan Joseph playing at 80% because he's carrying something, not the same guy at all. And that happens more than you know than a lot of other players. I will say with Houston secondary, they played as much cover two as anybody besides their division mate, the Indianapolis Colts. So they were a team that... You know, if you if you don't have the best secondary in the world and you play a little bit more zone, you can kind of hide some guys a little bit. I think they're going to have to do that. They did get good play from Ju- uh, Justin Reed, third-round rookie last year at safety. 
So that was encouraging. But yeah, again, Roby, Jonathan Joseph, and uh, you know guys like Tayshawn Gibson in the secondary, a few guys that just um, you know have to step up and play well. And on paper, it doesn't look great. Um, the pass rush will be good though. JJ Watt, ninety plus grade yep. last year. Not the same thing that we saw in two thousand twelve and thirteen, but still excellent there. Getting close. Yeah, and then the offensive side of the ball. I keep saying, you know, the Texans needed to really attack this O line in the yeah. draft the last couple of years, but because they spent all that draft capital to go, to go get Deshaun Watson, it's kind of the sacrifice that you make. You don't really have the draft capital to build your roster, and you get to this point where you have to use your top two picks on offensive tackles like they did last year, Titus Howard and Max Sharping. So um, can they get any better along yeah, the offensive not line? Not only do they sort of have to go that route, but it almost seemed as if they were – they knew themselves, we have to do this. So we're taking the best tackle on our board regardless of what happens. There was a fairly, they got outmaneuvered for right, Andre Dillard. There was a fairly strong perception that they were going to take Andre Dillard. Dillard got taken by the Eagles instead just in front of them. And they were like, ah, crap. And just took the next guy down on the board who was significantly lower rated by most other people. So it's not that he's necessarily a bad player. It's just that it looks like you basically got screwed for value where you took him. And missed out on a guy that was, I think, fairly strongly consensus better. Did we talk about this recently with the Trent Williams trade? Because I, I definitely talked about it on Houston Radio recently. We always discuss creep back toward average from an offensive line standpoint. Don't put all your eggs in one guy. Mm -hmm. But just like Dwayne Brown had a little bit of a trickle-down effect in Seattle, I think Trent Williams on this offensive line would almost have them average immediately because he's just compared to Julianne Davenport and Matt Khalil. Yes. He gives up a third of the pressure that those guys give up over the last few years. A third. Right. That's massive. So that's the thing. There's two things working with the offensive line. There's creep back towards average and there's just eliminate the big problems. Sure. Right. So if you have a turnstile at one of your five spots, if you can eliminate the turnstile, everything gets better. So the Texans, that line isn't good, but their biggest turnstile issue is a left tackle, whether it's Khalil or whether it's Julian Davenport. And you're right, moving to a Trent Williams would make a massive difference because of that. But the other really interesting dynamic with this Texans offensive line is that Deshaun Watson is one of those players, A, he's been able to play really well in the face of sustained pressure and a lot of it, right, which is unusual, strange, and not that many quarterbacks can do it. Two, he holds the ball about as long as any other quarterback in the NFL. So last season, his average time to throw was 2.84 seconds. The only two players ahead of that, Josh Allen, who was basically committing offensive line you know, homicide by the length of time he was holding the ball, and Russell Wilson, who is a really interesting comparison because he has also been dealing with an offensive line that has been garbage for a, a period of most of his career in Seattle. Plus holding the ball. But you have the added wrinkle of the fact that he causes a lot of his own pressure sure so the line has typically been terrible in seattle but even when it's been getting better it looks worse because wilson will call is the architect of a lot of the pressure he faces he will bounce away from clean pockets a lot of the time he just starts running backwards a lot of the time to basically cause things it's almost like you shake up the board and then let it reorganize itself so if he doesn't like what he sees he'll like shake it up get another glance downfield, and then he sees something open. Deshaun Watson, I think, has some of the same stuff in that he causes some of the pressure that he gets as well. And, and kind of like Wilson, he's almost comfortable playing in that fashion. So, yes, they need to make the offensive line not a complete disaster because nobody can deal with that. But you probably don't need to even get it as far as, you know, a solid average line across the board the way you would with most quarterbacks because they play him and Wilson play in that style. The thing about that style there, you know, because I saw you d discussing this online, you know, earlier today as well, people think that mobile quarterbacks make the O-line look good. And it depends on where your baseline is. Sometimes they do. Well, right? well, because people think that mobile quarterbacks, they, they just break free from a million sacks. Yeah. Therefore, they make your O-line look good. So if you're judging the O-line by sacks, then there's some truth to that. But we grade the offensive line based off the pressure that they allow and sometimes you might lose a block a little bit later and the QB still has the ball and it becomes a pressure so in our world holding the ball longer is inviting more pressure to your point and that's what Eric Eager wrote on the website today essentially QBs are inviting pressure now when you have a Deshaun Watson I think the most fascinating thing about him coming out of Clemson he was a one read guy 
for a lot of the time, and then he would take off and run. And, and you remember when Zach Robinson was here, he's saying, I don't know if he can mm-hmm. really go through progressions comfortably or if they're not allowing him to at Clemson. The, in the NFL, he's changed his style a little bit. He's really good pre-snap, and he'll get to where he needs to go. But if things go awry post-snap, instead of just taking off to run, he's taking off to he's making plays. He's yeah. passing. He's holding the ball, and that's why he's become such a good playmaker. I think over the next two years. So his year three development, I think you want to take fewer hits, you want to take more easy throws. But much like Russell Wilson, you like having that late in the down magic to rely on. We saw it, you know, against the Eagles when they upset them last year. I and mean, there's a lot of, I'm sorry, they lost against the Eagles, but he made a few um, nice plays down the stretch there. And I think the weapons are really intriguing for the first time. It's not just DeAndre Hopkins. Yes. It's Will Fuller who does make a significant difference because he brings something different. You've got Kiki QT there. Um, and they just acquired Duke Johnson, which, all right, they gave up a lot to get him. But he can be, you know, another one of those matchup problem players who you can a line in the backfield, you can split out as a true receiver. I'm you can all do about a lot that, man. with him. I'm all about that, especially with Watson in the backfield. Yes. There's a lot to play with there. I mm-hmm. think that is the way you build with playmakers in today's NFL. It's a team I would love to take over once that job's open at the end of the season, guys. So I got some plans. Have you got a t-shirt in the works? What did we say? How hard could it be? The AFC South? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Can we get Mike Quinn on that? Uh, to, uh, let's make that t-shirt. Houston Palazzolo. Texans, how hard... Could it be? Palazzolo for GM. How hard could it be? Okay, so it's last perfect. year, let's let's predict for the Texans here. Last year, you were a little sour on him, on them. I was a little sour on them. I think they're going to be right up there with the Colts competing for the division. What do you think? Yeah, I think this is a 500, 500 or better team. I think they should be threatening 8, 9, maybe even 10 wins. It's really, it's going to be about that offensive line, I think. How close to average can they get? Because I think that's the cap on what Watson can do. All right, let's move on to the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, so much to discuss here, of course, with Andrew Luck. Always broken. This, it, they're trying to say it's not like 2017, but 2017, it was months of like, oh, it can't be that bad. It's yeah. not that bad. He'll be fine. He'll be fine. And then you get into camp, and it's like, wait a second. I mean, it's not like that when are we going to see him. It's a different body part. It but is. other than that, it's exactly like that. Yeah, I mean, when you hear calf injury, I mean, like you had a calf injury the other day. You're, you're probably okay now. Yeah, I can still feel it, but I'm now two multiple people in this building tried to tell me I was about to snap my Achilles. You weren't one of them, thankfully, but other people, oh, you're fine. including somebody who has snapped his Achilles. So like, like, yeah, yeah they were like, oh, yeah, you, I mean, that's that's what happened to uh, Mike Quinn was like, that's what happened to Kevin Durant. I was like, Are you telling me I'm about to go out there and snap my Achilles? I, I mean, I'm not saying it. So but, you stopped working out. You stopped doing any. Yeah, anything? I stopped playing. In playing sport at the Y. And then Solly was like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what happens. Like you feel the calf and then the next day. Achilles is gone. It's sad because you were really making some big strides in our pickup right. basketball. I, I went from utterly, utterly useless to just moderately useless in, in a really short space of time. I think time. it was just one utterly useless, probably. Okay. No, no, it was. But wasn't. that was improvement. No, it was. You scored a basket? I did, yeah. One. Feisty on defense? I think defense is going to be my forte if I'm going to succeed at that game. I was really trying to help you out because you're you on were. my team. I'm you know, trying to maximize you, you your coach ability. You coached me up well. Because you helped me with my uh, soccer ability that one time we played soccer. Right, I was, anyway, trying, to, I was trying to give you instructions. Uh, the big story last year was Andrew Luck and that passing offense yeah. completely changed their style with um, under Frank Reich. He had uh, three-tenths of a second faster time to throw. We talk about quarterbacks who hold the ball longer and take all these hits. Mm-hmm. I think the narrative for years that Andrew Luck, this poor guy playing behind this bad offensive line, some of that's on him. Some of that's on the play calling, deeper drops. Some of that's on him trying to make b- big plays down the field. Now, there's there's risk and reward there. He makes incredible throws down the field. But last year, they snuck in some of those easier throws. Shaving three-tenths of a second per drop back is massive. And that's one of the reasons why the offensive line is in our top five or six right now. They, they are aided a little bit by that, but they're also helped out by Quentin Nelson, and they got really good play by Braden Smith. At right tackle. So things are really coming together on the offensive side of the ball right. for the Colts when Luck's healthy. Just in time for Jacoby Brissett to come in and, and dominate. And hold um, the ball much longer. Yes. So, yeah, I think most of the the issue with the, the length they held the ball was the play calling or this, the offense rather than Andrew Luck. Like, I don't think it was him. 
the way we talked about Wilson and Deshaun Watson kind of being comfortable playing in that style. I think Luck was comfortable with it. It's just, it, but that's not why it was happening. Like that was their offense. They had basically. more five and seven step right. drops than it was like, else. we have Andrew Luck. He's amazing. Therefore, the offense will be go as deep as you can. And Andrew Luck will find something spectacular to happen. And if he gets killed in the process, so be it. Which is, He's which a big, is, strong guy. We're comfortable in his durability. Which is odd because, again, he came out of Stanford and he was like, okay, perfect prospect. He, may, right. he can make every throw and he's really smart. So I was envisioning you know, using him like a Peyton or a Brady. And he turned out to be more of like a Roethlisberger or a Favre who yeah. was a little bit more And he's another, um, he's another player like Cam Newton to basically undermine this idea of large – solidly built human beings are inherently more durable like he's been I'm more battered. durable than you really you your knee is like falling to pieces you can't even yeah, walk that's because of, of age though anyway the point is cam newton has been used as a battering ram and is therefore breaking down right. andrew luck has been used as a target for defenses and is big therefore ben, breaking down joe flacco big ben constantly misses games on the other hand like spindly people like jared goff is like invulnerable at the moment. So maybe stop looking at just big stocky people and thinking they can take all the hits in the world because it's not Carson working out Wentz. that well. Big, strong, durable. Right. So honestly, it's a huge concern because this offense is shaping up to be a really impressive unit. The wide receivers, questions, I guess. You know, Devin Funches is slated to start for them. That's never great. Paris Campbell is an intriguing option, but he actually can't run routes at the moment, which is probably an issue. Um T.Y. Hilton is, is a really dangerous deep threat. They obviously have great chemistry, and I think the running game is solid. But this goes as far as Andrew Luck takes it, and if Andrew Luck is broken, Jacoby Brissett won't take it as far. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much the story. I mean, if you look at the... Yeah, the receivers aren't great on paper, but I think they'll they'll make do. I think they'll get a little yeah. bit out of Funchess as a big receiver, and they'll figure out how to you know gimmick up some plays. They for, do also for have Paris Penny Campbell. Hart, so I take it back. They're fine. Oh, yeah, they're, they're perfect. Uh, defensively, the Colts, uh, another, like we said about the Texans, a zone-heavy team. They said they want to play a little bit more man. They have added a lot of intriguing talent to this team the last two years, but especially when you see what Darius Leonard did last year as a rookie, a playmaking linebacker. Malik Hooker still playing on the back end there. Maybe they free him up into more true single high type of play, uh, you know, yeah. uh, role, uh, more of a single high role where he can make some plays. Uh, Rocky Asin gets drafted. A lot of your top pick defensive talent drafted this year. Like they went heavy on the defensive side in the draft. Um, this is interesting because, you know, we've talked before about the idea that this is a big year for Sean McVay's offense and that system generally because it needs to evolve. And if you don't evolve, NFL teams understand what you're doing and stop it eventually. I think the same is true for the Colts defense because they basically took the approach of, right, where our talent is not amazing. We're going to make this relatively idiot-proof and make, make, make it so that there's no thinking time involved. These players are doing everything at 100 miles an hour, and being able to do the simple things quickly will overcome a lot of the talent deficiencies, right? And it worked really well. But in year two, teams kind of know that's what you're doing. And I, if you're running this defense, I know how to beat this defense. So if you don't – like they, this idea of we want to run some more man coverage – like they need to. This needs to become a much more diverse defense than it was a year ago. Otherwise, it will be figured out, even if they've tried to address the talent deficiency by right. hammering it in the draft. So I think it's an interesting year to see how well that goes because, you know, a lot of the guys that were there last year and had question marks heading into last year in terms of how well they can actually play are still there. So are they still limited to being able to only deal with this, you know, crayons version of the offense or of the defense or can they expand along with it i think mike renner put it really well during draft time though he said they have a type on defense which is really long generally athletic guys some of the guys that they drafted ben banigu their second round pick rocky sin who i mentioned long athletic if you're playing zone that cuts down on passing lanes if you're playing press man it helps you at the line of scrimmage and then a guy like marvell tell who was one of our highest graded corners in preseason week one, who was a safety at USC, fifth round pick, really athletic, the type of guy that a Seattle, you know, those old, you know, those cover three teams would, you know, draft as a safety and convert to a corner. So I think the Colts, like, I don't, I didn't love all of the players that they drafted, right. but they brought in so many the last couple of years, especially on the defensive side 
that's the volume drafting I think is going to start paying off where they're, they're going to find a handful of pretty good players out of all those picks and that defense will will come together and it already started a little bit last yeah. year and the bottom line is they did they were playing well last season using that system so those guys are kind of there to bolster and to enhance with the idea that this this defense can evolve into a more diverse uh, system it's going to be an interesting group to watch because it was a pretty good defense last year then you had Justin Houston to the mix. He's opposite Jabal Sheard, and the pass rush gets a little bit of a boost. Houston was pretty efficient last year rushing the passer. He was part of that trio with the Kansas City Chiefs, along with Chris Jones and D. Ford, who could get after it at a high level. So um, I think the Colts are the team to beat if luck is healthy. Yes. If not, this division becomes wide pretty, open. pretty wide open because the Titans don't have any major holes in the Jags in any given year between Foles and that defense right. we'll talk about it in a second so um do you think the Colts should be the favorite based off how they've built this squad the last couple of years yeah assuming Andrew Luck is healthy I think they should be the favorite if he isn't healthy I think all bets are off and probably not I mean I don't I mean I don't think Jacoby Brissett is a terrible player but he's not Andrew Luck and this team will go as far as Andrew Luck takes them not Jacoby Brissett yeah I think Brissett has established himself that he's going to be one. He's one of the better backups. You know, he's a top 40 yeah. quarterback in the world. You know, he's one of the better backups in the NFL. If it's for a game or two, it's fine. If it's for the whole season again, like it was 2017, I don't have much faith in this, uh, in this Colts team. We'll be checking them out live in, uh, in training camp tomorrow or We're, today. When you guys hear this, uh, yeah. Brissett, we'll get to check out Jacoby Brissett against Baker. All right, all right, let's move on to the Jacksonville Jaguars. My Jacksonville Jaguars. God, you've been posting like 1997 highlights all up on Twitter. It was 97, 98, 99. I pulled yeah. it from all years. Okay. Some Brunel highlights. All right. Ah, miss Mark. Why is, Jim, why is there no Jimmy Smith for Hall of Fame campaign? There really needs to be. He was so good. Yes. And all of you were, I mean, look, I'm a Mark Brunel fan, but I'm not, I'm not an apologist. I, I understand <laughs> he wasn't perfect, and I'm not trying to push Mark Brunel for the Hall of Fame. But you said, hey, these look like Jimmy Smith highlights, <coughs> which they were. Yes. He was open deep at all times. Yes. And he wasn't exactly Randy Moss downfield as far as, but, um, as, far as being able to stack and like make plays. But he knew how to make plays on the ball, stack corners, and just be a big play threat. He was awesome. I mean, we talk about you know, most underrated players in the NFL. Jimmy Smith must be one of the most underrated players of all time. I think he it's is, the, drug, the drug issue. He is he right up there. But I don't think he got that recognition even at the time. No, he, he is right up there sure. with the best receivers to ever play the game, and his name never comes up in the Hall of Fame debate. He was right there with Marvin Harrison. Him yes, and Harrison, absolutely, almost identical players so as Harrison far as they could be in. deep threats. Harrison is in. Now we're campaigning for Torrey Holt, and I think there's a fair case for Torrey Holt to come in. Where, I think Jimmy the, was better than Torrey right, Holt. Where is the Jimmy Smith case? He should be in there. Smith and McArdle, they were awesome. So my old... My old 90s Jacks. Anyway, I love those guys. So from from, from Smith and McCardell to, uh, to Marquise Cole. Lee, D.D. Westbrook, D.J. Chark, Chris Connolly, Keelan Cole, Terrell Pryor. Oh, God. All right. So the offensive side of the ball, they bring in Nick Foles. No matter what Nick Foles did during the Super Bowl run in Philadelphia, no matter what he did back in 2013 statistically, I think we're talking about a guy who even the biggest Nick Foles fans – wouldn't put him in the top half of the NFL quarterbacks. Ooh. I think if you found people ranking quarterbacks in a vacuum, some people might have them at like 18 or 19. Uh, you know, there's probably a case that, you know, Nick Foles versus a Marcus Mariota or a Jameis Winston, you know, you could, you know, I, I wouldn't hate people that said, hey, Fo I, I would rather go to, go to battle with Foles. But he's probably in the bottom third overall, you know, just from a throw for throw basis. And so the high-end play can be there. We've seen it with Philadelphia, but that was in a spectacular system with a really good variety of playmakers. And Jacksonville doesn't look like it's got that same supporting cast. No, it doesn't at all. Um, and what's really ridiculous is like he seems like, or he seemed like the perfect quarterback for that, the middle-class deal that we keep talking about, right? Yeah. It's I'm not sold on Nick Foles, but I'm fine with paying him good starter money as long as he plays at a good starter level. So let's kind of, let's do a little bit of, you know, try before we buy and, or a pay as you go system. I'm right. going to pay you quality money as long as you're giving me quality play and everybody's happy. Kind of like the deal that Andy Dalton is on, right? Which is mm -hmm. basically as long as you're earning this money with this play, we're good. 
but the second that doesn't happen, we're moving on quickly. Right. But Foles didn't get that. He got the huge deal. Um, and they basically said, hey, we're, we're giving him this money because if we gave him less money, he wouldn't have the respect of the locker room. Now that, I mean, come on. That's just not good sense, right? It's not how I would do it, but <laughs> that's I mean, how the Jags did it. It feels like that would fall, fall, fall foul of the how hard could it be mantra. Like you're making things harder for you're yourself. You're making things a little bit more difficult. Let's let's here's what could happen positively for the Jags. As volatile as we've shown Foles to be, and I I love the graphic that I posted uh, recently, where just over the last two years, the top two graded games. It just sums them up. Yeah, the top two graded games by the Eagles by Eagles quarterbacks out of the top twenty, both top two were Nick Foles, and I think what do you have three out of the, the top bo- yeah. five or something like that. And then the rest are Wentz. Yeah. And but the two the, were the NFC Championship game and the Super Bowl. And the Super Bowl. So they're right. not just the best two games, but the two most important games they played. At the right time, he did it. The worst two and the worst like three out of five or something. And though the worst six out of ten, I think it was, were all foals in about half the games yeah. that he played. So he's played extremely poorly. So as volatile as he showed in 2017 and 18 when he played with the Eagles, he's never really been a big turnover prone type of guy. So last year you were like, hey, I think Cody Kessler can run this idiot-proof offense and let the defense do their work. In reality, because Kessler is really limited, Mm -hmm. right, physically, Foles is, he's he's volatile, but ultimately lands, he can land on that game manager type of spectrum as far as taking care of the football, if that all makes sense. His volatility is more missing throws rather than chucking it into coverage. Yeah. So he could be a good fit if the Jags play 2017 defense. That, I think, is the key to this entire team, right? It's Nick Foles is unlikely, very unlikely, to be the quarterback that carries this offense and carries this team on his shoulders and takes them to the promised land for any extended period of time. Like, maybe he'll go on a run and you'll catch three games that are like that and it'll look great. Right. But he's not going to do that for 19 games, which is essentially what needs to happen for that kind of thing. If this team is going to be successful, they need that defense to get back to the level where it was arguably the best unit in football. They had this suffocating defensive front, this incredible pass rush that ran really deep. You had Jalen Ramsey playing like the best cornerback in the game. You were stuffing teams on defense, and then all your offense needed to do was to not trip over itself, and you were winning games. Foles can do that, I think. and I I agree he's well capable of being that kind of quarterback for them. But you can't make him have to do more than that, at least not for any you know length, because he's a little bit like Kirk Cousins in that regard, and that he's capable of those games, as we've seen, but it's not going to happen for 16 of them. You need right. to help him out with other stuff. Especially, you're leaving the Eagles, who had a couple nice tight ends, Alshon Jeffrey, Aguilar. You know, they had all these different type of playmakers. The Jaguars, D.D. Westbrook is a good, you know, they have a bunch of number two and three wide receivers. D.D. Westbrook's a good complementary piece. Is he going to be the key the key guy there, Marquise Lee's battled a ton of injuries. We mentioned uh, at some point this offseason, their fourth, fifth, and sixth guys that are competing for playing time, DJ Chark, Chris Conley, Terrell Pryor. I mean, all guys that are athletic. Yeah, you put them all together, you got one useful receiver. Yeah, so it's trying to figure out, can one of those guys emerge truly as a deep threat? Keelan Coles has, has flashed at times, but nothing exciting. And then you talk about this offensive system. They want to run something similar to what they did in Philadelphia which is 12 personnel heavy. That's two tight ends. Jeff Swain, Josh Oliver, who I like as a third-round pick, but, you know, he's a third-round pick out of San Jose State. So can they even create those tight end type of mismatches? You know, it just feels like it's going to be a little work in progress, and the Jags need to put a ton of resources toward building up those playmakers over the the next Foles years. Yeah, Um, and then you have this idea of they still want to be a power-running football team with Leonard Fournette, who has just not worked out yet, and an offensive line that I think is making strides in the right direction, but isn't there yet. So the offensive line is unlikely to be the thing that determines whether this team will dominate an offense or not, and Leonard Fournette certainly isn't. So again, that kind of rests. Like the offense is Nick Foles, which brings us back to our issue, where if this team is going to succeed, it needs the defense to dominate because... We never talk about the run game. Because Nick Foles is unlikely to you know, pick up this entire offense. We just never talk about the run game. We can talk about it. Like Fournette is not a a great running back so far. I think the 2017 Jags sum up the reason why a team that wants to play old school, run the ball, play good defense. It's just 
uh, it's difficult to sustain. And that's not to say that good passing teams can't fluctuate a little bit, but it felt like the 2017 Jags, it was fool's gold. When you can win multiple games where your quarterback's throwing the ball 14 or 15 times in today's NFL, you either played a horrible offense on the other side or your defense is the 85 Bears. And the 2017 Jags, they had a really good defense. But they also played, you know, Tom Savage. They didn't get to, they faced a half of Deshaun Watson off the bench. They played Blaine Gabbert. They played this run of poor quarterbacks. And once they ran into Jimmy Garoppolo down the stretch, down the, at the end of the yeah. year, Tom Brady in the playoffs, Ben Roethlisberger in the playoffs, things change. And this is what we always talk about. The defense is very dependent on who you're playing. I also think Leonard Fournette is essentially a failure of evaluating, not because he hasn't turned out to be as good as they thought he was, but because of the reasons behind it. So... I think there is still a there are still instances whereby guys can dominate at the college level by being physically more uh, imposing than the opposition in a way that won't necessarily translate to the next level. So you see guys like Cam Newton do it at the college level, and it's like, well, you are still Cam Newton at the NFL level is every bit as much of an athletic freak as he was at the college level. Therefore, it still works. Right, right? Leonard Fournette is running over and past people at the college level in a way that he just isn't able to do at the NFL level. So there's a ton of people where he was way too big, way too fast, way too uh, strong, and they just couldn't tackle him in college. But those guys don't really exist at the NFL level. And now we're discovering that, okay, you're reasonably big, but you're no bigger than half the other running backs in the league. Yeah, You're reasonably fast, but you're not faster than all the linebackers that are chasing you down. You need to be able to make guys miss right. in space. You're not elusive. Right. So you're not, you, all the things that were your unique calling cards in college don't function anymore, and you don't have the thing that you need in order to be able to function at a higher level. So you look at his NFL career so far. He's broken 55 tackles over two years. Saquon Barkley last year broke more than that in one year. And what about that stretch? I know he's banged up a little bit, but the end of 2017, he broke like two on like 70 carries or something like that. Yeah, and then like six of those, six of his 17 last season came in one game against Miami where they just elected not to tackle people. Yeah, I think the problem with Fournette was even when he was, even in games where he's picking up four or five a pop, it was when the O-line gives him three yards or four yards of a clear run. He knows how to like stick it in there and get the extra three or four. Yeah, and but you but those are plays where if you gave that to Christian McCaffrey or you gave that to Saquon, there's a chance that's going for thirty, forty, or fifty. There, it's with Fournette. He had that ninety yard run against Pittsburgh, which again, trying to bring context to this, was one of the worst busted run fits I've ever seen. Yeah, and he ran in a straight line, which he does pretty fast. Yes, for for ninety yards. So that's his other strength is that once he's going, he's moving quick. He's fast, right? But yeah. those guys need. To get going, which right. means you need a good blocking to open up a open up a runway for you to actually get moving, so that you can then be a real problem to, to stop. If the offensive line isn't opening up a yawning chasm for you to run through, you don't get to hit top speed before you hit a defender and he tackles you. Yeah, so I don't think we don't think Fournette's an impact player. No. Okay, nicely said. So there you um, go. Talked so on, the run game. on the defensive side of the ball, Jalen Ramsey took a little bit of a step back last year. That's kind of the nature of cornerback play. I still think he's a top two, top three corner in the NFL. I think we ranked him just behind Stephon Gilmore on our top 50 heading into the season. A.J. Boye on the other side. Again, a fascinating case. A guy that we said, hey, man, is he just a one-year wonder coming out of Houston in his 2016? But 17 and 18 have both been good. So it's one of the best corner duos in the NFL. Miles Jack has emerged as a nice athletic linebacker, and they still have all these pass rushers, and they just added Josh Allen as a first-round pick out of Kentucky. Yeah, it's interesting. So they lose um, Malik Jackson. Yes, they lose Malik Jackson, who goes to Philadelphia, but they kind of replace him, I think, with Josh Allen in a weird way because I suspect what would happen if they're being sensible is you end up on those sub-packages with Ngakwe and Josh Allen on the edge, and then you kick Calais Campbell inside to play right. the Malik Jackson play role anywhere. Yeah. of that three-tech spot, and now you've got those three pass rushes again. So Plus Malik- Taven Bryan, 2018 first-rounder, yeah. to add into the rotation. So that defensive front has the ability to be every bit as good as it was a couple of years ago where they were dominant. The secondary still has the ability because it's basically the same guys, and then Miles Jack has become a better player at that point. The, the talent is definitely there for this defense to be as good as they need it to be. We just, I mean, it was the same thing was true last year, right? And they weren't. 
It, it absolutely is. And again, from a team building standpoint, it's weird because you know when you're doing mock drafts, and I don't always try to draft for need, but you try to see where where teams might lean and all that stuff. There was a couple of years there where it felt like, hey, the Jags don't have any major holes on the roster other than QB. That's why they went with Leonard Fournette at number four overall. You know, the teams that do pick a running back, it's usually when they're feeling pretty good yeah. about everything else. And they get suckered in and like, well, I don't need another tight end. I don't need another edge rusher. Let me grab a running back to kind of top things off. But I do think there's been some neglect to the playmakers at receiver, to the skill position players. And we're starting to see that right now. And then on the defensive side of the ball, you know, you've just got you know, Tayshawn Gibson, and you've got, um, who's the strong Barry church. You've got like a few guys that were part of that 2017 defense that they have to just replace, but I don't think it's a major concern. They've, they've added guys like Ronnie Harrison in the third round in 2018 to play strong safety. Uh, you know, they've added some talent there. So I think defense, it's okay. The place where there's been a little bit of neglect though, I think the playmakers and that could come back to bite. So ultimately, how is it going to shake out? I, I, I think it's going to take a, a miraculous Foles run for them to compete for the division. I think, you know, unless there's injuries and stuff, they're the worst team in the division. Mm. Yeah. Not that I can't see a way that the defense steps up again. It's just what we're learning again. It's, you know, you don't want to yeah. rely on defense. Can it happen? Sure. This seems like a division that's going to be relatively tightly bunched. I think like so. the worst team will be six yeah. and ten. The best team will be, be eleven and five, ten and six, and everybody's going to be within four games or whatever. But how hard could it be? How hard could it be? Division. All right, now the Tennessee Titans. Yes. The epitome of the nine and seven team. That's what their last three years. Which is ironic, since they don't have Jeff Fisher anymore. I know, right? They went Still from seven and nines. Them. Still to nine and them. sevens. I keep coming back to Mariota. Yeah. When he came out, him and Jameis. He's a. He's like a. He's a 500, you know, type of QB, a guy that you're gonna you're gonna win some games. Are we ready in the to, uh, to start a quarterback controversy yet? Between Mariota and Tannehill, yeah. I, honestly, I think we've seen enough of Ryan Tannehill that I don't. Haven't we also seen enough of Marcus Mariota? We've seen less of Marcus Mariota. Mariota. I don't think, I don't think we've seen Mariota with the best group of playmakers. True. I, I've, I've said before, I, I have some concerns about Mariota. Natural playmaking ability for such an athletic quarterback. One of our worst graded outside the pocket players. Doesn't have the best clean pocket grade. grade you know, that has the highest like single season PFF grade between the two? At Tannehill. Yeah. Okay. One season. Yeah. What, 2013? Yeah. 80.4, which, by the way, in and of itself speaks volumes about both these players, that 80.4 is the highest BFF grade that either of them have attained since they came into the league. They're, they're in the middle class where they're going to be dependent on those around them. And I think what Mar Mariota adds a little bit more with his legs as a runner, not so much outside the pocket as a player. I think Tannehill, Tannehill, and I was just looking at this today, I was looking at red zone accuracy and stuff like that. So there are some stats where... Every now and again, a guy like Andy Dalton or Ryan Tannehill kind of like creeps into the top 10 and you post it out on Twitter or something like that. And you get fans that are like, well, I know this is stupid because Dalton's in the top 10 or Tannehill's in the top 10. Mm -hmm. So one where the Tannehill's of the world are not in the top 10 is red zone accuracy. And when you go through that list over the last, you know, three or four years, it's Brady, Breeze, Rodgers. It's all the best quarterbacks. And there's guys like Tannehill and Mariota, even though Mariota's red zone Stats are pretty good, just like tight area accuracy. When you have to, when you have to have a touchdown, all the best quarterbacks separate themselves. And I think you know, throw for throw basis, maybe there's not a huge difference in Tannehill and Mariota and some other quarterbacks like a Big Ben or whatever it is. But when you get in the tight red zone, Big Ben and Russell Wilson, all the best quarterbacks are making plays. So I think that's part of where those guys are lacking. I've never seen Tannehill elevate. His right. Group. What's interesting, though, is that you've got Mariota playing at the end of his fifth year option. Sure. So if you do re up him, it's going to cost you a fortune. Oh, I don't know that I'm ready to do that. You could re up Ryan Tannehill for like $75 and a bag of Cheetos at this point. Oh, and so I don't long, know there's a dramatic difference between the two players. As a long term de um, decision, I would probably consider that. If I if I don't get the Houston job and I'm landing in, in Tennessee. Right. It comes how hard to, could it be? Right. How hard could it be? It, it, it comes down to this DAC decision. I think before the Mariota class, 
finding guys as good as Mariota was difficult. Yes. Right? Now finding guys as good as Mariota is easier. Yes. Much easier. They're just spread throughout the league. And Ryan Tannehill is one of those guys who's in that cluster with Mariota. So five or six years ago when we were podcasting, we'd say, man, you just got to find a top 15 guy, hit your wagon to him and go. And like Andy Dalton was that cutoff. Now I think we're in top. We, we Now we're Matt Ryan rule, right? Now we're the top 10 guy. If you have Matt Ryan or better, mm-hmm. you hit your wagon to those guys. And then anything below that, or maybe it's Carson Wentz or better. Yeah, there's certain, maybe it's a little bit bigger cutoff. But once you have QB 12 through 23 or 24, there's a lot of those guys right now. And you just move on and you get the next guy and you get them on a rookie contract and you don't feel as bad as you would maybe five or six years ago. Yeah, I think we're reaching the point where the difference, like Alex Smith is always the contract, right? The $100 million contract to Alex Smith. And you're like, was he ever worth that? No. But the time he signed that, you would do so much. The chances of you doing worse than Alex Smith and a lot worse than Alex Smith was huge because there were, like, the bottom end of the quarterback group and that seemed to be coming up a lot, was terrible. So if you didn't pay him, you go back into quarterback hell and you are completely lost. But you, now, the chances of hitting a guy that's average is pretty high. Like, it, it's actually right. not that hard to find those guys at all. So you're not stuck in this situation where, ah, I mean, he's, he is an average quarterback, so I have to pay him $100 million. It's like, no, you don't. You can, if you think he's just an average quarterback and he's not going to get any better than that, Throw a dart in the draft. You're probably going to hit an average quarterback. And and so this is and, and so this is how well the Chiefs played it. I, I don't know if they were doing this the through the entirety of the Alex Smith contract, but clearly they made a power move to go get Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. Once they saw him, if you have Alex Smith locked up to a contract, or Marcus Mariota, or Jameis Winston, or Derek Carr, or Dak Prescott, always play that game. Always look for the next Patrick Mahomes yeah. until you find him. And then you move on from the average. So as long as you're playing the game the right way, and that's how I would do it, Houston, even with Deshaun Watson, I'd be looking for that next guy. Wow. I would probably... I, Watson might be the cutoff now, right. to be honest. I mean, he's in, yeah. We're about to rank him number 12 in our QB rankings. Yeah. Him and Goff at like 12 and 13 might be the actual... Cutoff. Cutoff right certainly there. Certainly for... I mean, certainly if you've got them for low money, you keep... Like oh, not, for low, oh, absolutely. At, once you need to get to the point of paying him 120 million, now maybe we have a different conversation. Anyway, with Mariota, um, it, this is truly the make or break year. They've yeah. added Adam Humphreys as a nice little slot threat. Get like 357 targets this year. Based and off deserve of, every single one of them. Based off week one, uh, Corey Davis, the Hall of Famer, AJ Brown, uh, second round pick, who's who's pretty good. Yeah, well, you know, right up there among the best receivers in the draft i don't know if he'll hit the ground running right away but i think this group should come together a yeah. little bit you know? by the way can i clarify that i don't mean that he deserves every single one of those targets because he's good though he's reasonable i mean he deserves every single one of those targets because he turned down the chance to go to the patriots to join tennessee yeah like he essentially verbally agreed with them not thinking that the patriots are going to be interested it's like yeah yeah we'll, i'll join you when free agency opens and then the patriots came calling and instead of what I think everybody else in the known world would do, which is say, um, sorry, Tennessee, the Patriots have just called and they have a pretty good track record of people that play like me. I'm going to go play there instead with Tom Brady. He went, no, I'm going to honor my gentleman's agreement with the gentleman, the fine gentleman of Tennessee. Man of his word. Sorry, New England. So frankly, if he doesn't have 200 passes thrown his way this season, the Titans screwed him. I'm curious to know if the Titans take what Derrick Henry did down the stretch last year where he did go full beast mode a few times 99 yard run against Jacksonville yeah. and if they do feed him a bit more sure I mean I think a lot of that was you know <laughs> built off that 99 yard run he did run differently though down the stretch I mean he it wasn't just that game there were other right. games where he um but ran it, the ball really well I don't know if that's going to trick them into going back to more of a power run style not power run necessarily but just run heavy style um and the old line's pretty solid it is i mean the, the, it's the story of the team this position group is solid this yeah. position group is solid the quarterback is solidish right i mean that's it that's what they are yeah i mean i think the offense the the receiving group doesn't yet overwhelm but i think it's moving in the right direction i think an aj brown will really help Maybe not right away, but down the line. So I think the offense is moving in the right direction. The question endlessly is, 
what is Mariota going to be? Is it just going to be this average quarterback or can he actually change what he is at any point? Um, and then it comes down to what the defense is going to look like. And I'm kind of unsure as to what this defense is going to look like. They've, you know, done so much and there's been a lot of turnover and you've, you know, imported New England south. Where are we headed? Yeah, south of New England, right? South, yeah, Nashville. Right. So this is there's, New England. There's New south England there. deep south in Miami. Yes. And then there's New England south in Nashville. Yeah. No, no, we called it New England mid-south. Mid-south. Like mid-south wrestling. Okay. That was the one guy who thought that was the best reference. Right. So mid-south right. So wrestling New England reference. mid-south yes. on the defense. I just, I'm not 100% sure what it's going to look like yet. Yeah, and they had games. I mean, they shut down New England's offense, held them to 10 points in a game last year. They had games where they looked really good, games where they looked not so good. And from a secondary standpoint, Logan Ryan, Malcolm Butler, Adoree Jackson, as a trio, that's pretty good. Yeah. As a trio, that's nice. Kevin Byard on the back end, who's become one of the best playmaking safeties. And now the best paid safety in NFL history. Right? Yes. Making bank. Even Deion Sanders, I think, knows his name now. Eventually. Um, I think one of the big question marks, they've been, they've been trying to replace Brian Arakpo. Yeah, the pass uh, rush. You know, for a while and just try um and Derek Morgan, those guys were kind of the the staples there for a few years. Harold Landry, can he take the step up in year two? Cameron Wake comes in on a little uh one year deal. So. still generating a ridiculous amount of pressure for a guy that age and that predicated off like explosive coil off the line of scrimmage. <sighs> yeah. Like yeah. you'd think if if you know, if somebody is gonna get old and start to wane because of what they how they win. It Should would be, be Cameron him. Wake, but no, apparently not. Hasn't yet. So we're expecting big things from Landry. Jayon Brown's an intriguing, athletic, inside linebacker. So again, it's just solid across the board. Yeah. Feels like another 8-8. Eight and eight, nine, Well, it feels like another 9-7 and seven capable team. It also feels like this is a team that the additions they made in the draft seem like they're going to help 2020's team more than they are 2019. Now you've yeah. got A.J. Green on offense, who we said it would take a while AJ to adjust. Brown, yeah. Or sorry, A.J. Brown. You also um, drafted Jeffrey Simmons, who obviously was injured and is going to probably miss you know, the year as well. So their two most immediate impact players are not going to make an immediate impact, likely. It's more a, a or a 2020 job from the yeah. draft there was one of our favorite drafts because aj brown nate davis on the offensive side of the ball amani hooker at yeah. safety i mean there was just a lot i mean honestly a guy like amani hooker could be their biggest impact rookie just because of the way well yeah if he's if he plays a little strong safety next to kevin byard he's really good we i mean i think he's a he's got starting potential yeah. for particularly a guy that was when, in the fourth yeah. round particularly when kenny vaccaro is your other starter yeah i always liked vaccaro as like you can kind of play the run in the box you can kind of cover tight ends but there's a lot more of those guys yeah in the nfl now um so nine and seven no let's go eight and eight eight and eight. break the duck break the nine and seven and run by going eight and eight now you said aj green and i immediately corrected you yes you, you and i are professionals we're on tv mm-hmm regularly now and you know we've got this award-winning podcast and millions and millions of listeners but we've never had formal training in the media space okay what's the tact what's the proper way do i just let you roll like so when you misspeak by accident say aj green that was smooth i don't want to be i don't want to be mean and be like hey idiot it's aj well yeah that would be that would be the wrong way of doing it i think the way you did it was was perfect i just want to make sure like because i want the listeners to know right because i mean when you're doing that most of the time like you don't hear it yourself you was like your brain thinks it said the right name right right so you just need a guy to come in there and go no you meant i'm just making sure the protocol's right there. no i think that's good and then then that registers in my brain that i said it wrong it's like oh yeah of course yeah right aj brown Brown. yeah i don't know i think that was good all right just making sure yeah just wanted to talk through that so there you go. AFC South, how hard could it be? How that's, hard uh, could it be? That's the breakdown. Uh, a lot of intriguing storylines there. So that's four divisions out of eight. We're halfway through. We'll do one more probably Friday. Mm-hmm. Uh, recorded Friday, probably drop either Friday or sometime this weekend. Uh, more preseason action this weekend. So I think what next Monday we'll do a little preseason week two recap. Yep. I mean, there are stories coming out of this thing. We just got to keep talking about it. Well, there should be more now. Like week one is a bit of a write-off, but week week two should should be some story about. Good storylines. You just never know when you're going to get that big Mac Wilson game. All right. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to Chris for uh, (laughs) 
not being here so that we could use his office again. Let's assume he hasn't fired us by the time you listen to this. Yeah, maybe. Uh, not so much thanks to him then if that's happened. Who would take over the NFL podcast? We'd have Mike uh, and. It'd be Mike. Right, it'd just be Mike. It'd be Mike reading own. lists. Yeah. Let me read the top 50, 150 <laughs> players on the draft, fifty guide. draft board. Team, yes, player that's what by player. Do. He's trying to rename it after himself and everything. We gotta <laughs> gotta rein him in. All right, guys, we'll talk to you on uh, Friday, sometime at the end of the week. We'll pick another division. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game, push the button. College football, push the button. The YouTube channel from PFF.